Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, everyone, and welcome to another uh, Gaudium at Space22.com blog uh, blogcast, podcast, <laughs> and YouTube video. I am Dr. Larry Chapp. I rarely introduce myself in these things anymore, but I, I guess I should. And I'm joined by uh, three guys I've had on the show before. Very excited to have them back. I said to myself at the end of the summer, after a long hiatus from doing these interviews, I needed to get the band back together. And here the band is back together. So I have, of course, my uh, former uh, uh, colleague, Dr. Rodney Hauser, who is out on work release from a local prison because he is a convicted felon. And <laughs> but there's currently no evidence of that, but I'll just say it anyway. Uh, anyway, it's good to see you, Rodney. Rodney, are you still department chair at DeSales University? No, I passed that thing on. Yeah, you have passed that baton on to Dr. Sarah Hulse, I hear. So, Sarah, if you're listening, uh, good luck to you. And uh, Stay out of prison. So, so you <laughs> You're yeah, you're now in charge of the of the Salesian Center for Shimmy Shang, whatever the heck Salesian Center is in charge of. Please you know. slow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's a there's this entity on campus called the Salesian Center for the study of. I'm actually you know, not doing that. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, no crap. Yeah, well, no, that's I, good. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. So I've kind of switched gears. So. Well, that's good to hear. Anyway. Yeah. We won't get into that. Anyway, we also have enough enough pitter patter. Uh, we have also uh, Dr. David C. Schindler and Dr. Michael Hanby, both of whom teach at the John Paul II Institute for Studies on the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family in Washington, D.C. on the campus of the Catholic University of America, both. Well, all three of my guests have numerous scholarly publications and so on and yada, 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 and so on. So the bona fides are established. I'm just happy to have them here. Today's conversation, uh, at least it's going to begin. We, I want to talk about theological anthropology, and that may not sound like a real juicy topic to a lot of people, but it really is. It's kind of this. It was the centerpiece in many ways of, of the pontificate of John Paul II. I mean, his very first encyclical was Redemptor Hominis, which was an extended sort of theological discourse on theological anthropology in the light of Christology, which in John Paul's eyes was an extension of the Second Vatican Council's theological anthropology and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it's very, very important to take a look at this topic, especially in light of the fact that the, the issue has raised its head again in the church especially with regard to questions of the meaning of freedom, uh, the meaning of freedom in, in the context of moral theology, the meaning of freedom in the context of, of human sexuality. And indeed, uh, the Synod on Synodality, which completed at the end of October, issued a final document, which was actually rather anodyne and disappointed many of the progressives in the church for not pushing the needle further in certain directions. But it did contain one little nugget in there in which it said the church does need to take a good long look, relook or reinterpretation of its theological anthropology with an eye towards things like human sexuality and so forth. So uh, as my friend, Father Robert Imbelli has said to me, theological anthropology, Larry, that's where it's at. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road here. And it's, it's what we need to talk about. So I'm going to I'm going to turn it over first. Uh, I don't know who wants to go first, but I, I, I'm just going to ask be, beginning wise a very generic question, which is, do, do you agree? That's going to be my first question. Do you agree that theological anthropology is uh, really kind of one of the top two or three burning issues uh, that theologically speaking that confronts the church today? That That's sort of my opening question. So. Uh, but let's start with uh, just because he's nodding his head up and down. I'm going to start with David. I, yeah. yeah. So beware I, nodding your head up and down, guys. Yeah, there you go. Now I've learned my lesson. I, and know, then you guys, the other guys can chime in whenever they want. So go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I'm not going to make a long statement. Just just may, maybe just one observation. But, um, you know, in a certain sense, for me, I always think that uh, the major theme is always going to end up being metaphysics in a certain sense. You know, fundamental theology or 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 um, dogmatic theology and how it's interpreted, but metaphysics. But you know, arguably, 
um, and this is this is a position held by uh, one of the philosophers I, I follow most, Fernando Ulrich. You best understand metaphysics. You best understand um, being the nature of being by looking at man and the human being and how how um, man lives his uh, existence. It's the one uh, instance in the physical world where the the meaning of being is something that is actively and consciously and deliberately participated in and either affirmed or rejected. And uh, and so the way man lives his being in a way is a is a is an interpretation of the whole of reality. And and in fact, you know, arguably sets sets the horizon within which we do all of our thinking and and uh, deliberating and, and and acting. So if if there's a if there's a problem in in one's um, anthropology uh, and in both in its philosophical and its theological sense, it's going to show up in absolutely everything else that one thinks about. So in that sense, it's it's inescapable um, and inescapably right there at the foundations. And uh, yeah. in that regard, you know, there's nothing more important. I think I remember reading once a very dense article in Comunio by Angelo Scola hmm. uh, that I had to read and reread before it sank in, where he, he essentially said that the key, the key to understanding Balthazar's system is to understand that it's articulating a meta anthropology. Right. I believe yeah. is that is that my right? Did he write that some? He did. Yeah. And I've, I mean, just a quick comment on that point. Um, uh, you know, some people get nervous that he's he's trying to replace the classical tradition that makes metaphysics the first philosophy. But I think it's uh, it's it's meant to be interpreted in precisely along the lines I was just suggesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he raised that. Balthazar raised that uh, or introduced that notion. Um, uh, given. Uh, you know, looking at etym etymologically, metaphysics suggests that um, the the paradigm uh, of being, the sort of the the paradigmatic instance of being, is physis, is physical nature, and it's 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 moving beyond that uh, analogically that you that you enter into the larger questions. And he just wanted to say that while that's not false. Um, the fundamental way that we understand nature is not, you know, rocks and trees, although those are absolutely indispensable, but, in, in, you know, most fundamentally the human being. So it's, it's, it's not so much a replacement of the classical tradition. It's just the deepening of the insight of what, what metaphysics is all about and realizing that, you know, this is a, a central theme for, for Ulrich, but, you know, the place where the meaning of being uh, comes most fully in, in, uh, in expression is in human beings' relationship to each other and and one's relationship to oneself. In a certain sense, how one lives one's body, and 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 the yeah. the most original human relations that spring out of that um, male and female. He created them. So so marriage and childbirth and so forth become become the uh, privileged place where the meaning of being comes to expression. Very interesting. I can talk Rodney, a lot of now. Rodney's nodding his head, so I think. That uh, yes, he, yes. Please go next. Maybe uh, we'll just go around this way. There we go. No, I just wanted to add a maybe a christological note to that too. That, that um, Aquinas says somewhere that the way that the son comes from the father is the paradigm for the way everything comes from from the father, right? All of creation, right? And and uh, and of course that would include the human person. And so, yeah, one of the things I think that's a little bit troubling about certain forms of, of contemporary Catholic thought is the notion that we can kind of work out an anthropology um, in advance, uh, you know, that that sort of then we tack a, you know, I don't know, a Christological understanding of the human person or whatever on top of that. And, and I just think that's, that's, that's deeply problematic because, you know, Christ not only reveals, you know, God to us when he's in the flesh, but he also reveals to us what it means to be a human being. And, and, and he, re and he reveals that meaning as, you know, sort of absolutely making a gift of oneself at all times, you know, sort of both to the father, but also to his fellow human beings. And that seems to be to run 
deeply contrary to all of the fundamental anthropological notes that you get in classical liberalism, right? So um, I, I think this is this is a this is kind of in a sense where the rubber hits the road. The church has a fundamentally different understanding of what it means to flourish as a human being than the the, the very basis of, of our social institutions almost in 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 in, in a de democratic liberal society. So um, you know, I would add that Christological note is all, but you know, David's absolutely right. The metaphysics comes to a head, so to speak, in the in the human person. Michael, thought about shaking my head in hopes of being avoided. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I don't have a great deal to add to it uh, except a couple of thoughts. I mean, um, uh, Hans Jonas suggested that uh, the living human body or the living human embodied person was what he called. Um, and this very much accords, I think, with with, with what David with what Dave's saying that the maximum concrete ontological completeness known to us, mm -hmm. um, uh, in which you have the coincidence of uh, of inwardness and outwardness, intensivity, extensivity, um, uh, spirit and matter, um, uh, indiv indivisibly united. And suggested, in fact, that on this basis, you could completely invert the the, the stereotypically modern perspective of beginning with the most primitive uh, and heretofore unintelligible instance of, of nature and arriving at us additively and accidentally, as it were, and mm -hmm. rather begin with the most full and complete expression, the, you know, the the, the densest um, condensation, as it were, of being, uh, and work subtractively. Mm -hmm. um, from from what's full, and I've always thought that was a, a, an extraordinary. Uh, I, I don't know that it's been uh, followed up to a great degree, um, but I've always thought that was an extraordinary tantalizing suggestion. The only thing I would add, and this is uh, these are two really superficial points, but um, they might be of, of some use to at least some of your your listeners. I mean. You know, we throw around words like theological anthropology, uh, and it sounds really rarefied and technical. What we're really talking about here is simply what the human being is, uh, what the human being is in both the deepest and highest and most complete sense. And of course, the, the human being in the in the deepest and, and, and highest and most complete sense is the human being who is both from and stands before God. So so there's that. Uh, and then the second thing I would point out is, is what a time, uh, what a moment in history uh, to begin to think that we need to, re to, to revise and revisit these notions. What, what, what a moment to open them up for questioning when the assault on any coherent sense of human being, um, both ideologically speaking and technologically speaking, is so pronounced and so vicious, we'll decide at this moment uh, to, to to reopen the question as opposed to entering more deeply into what we've already been given. And I, I find that extraordinary. You know, just a quick comment. You know, uh, I was thinking, as you said, that's an excellent point of uh, one of Ignatius's uh, principles of discernment. Um, you know, when you're when you're trying to make a decision, he said that when you're in a state of confusion and anxiety, that's precisely not when you make a decision. And, and and what you're meant to do there is to stick to the last decision that you made when you were at peace and and uh, you know clearly in a state of consolation. I mean because because it's only when you have a, a clear vision that you can properly you know revise a thing. I mean I that that's one of my favorite Ignatian principles. I think it's a really profound one and it speaks you know analogously to this situation directly. Which is probably why even though we have a Jesuit Pope, <laughs> there was no mention of the spiritual methodology of Ignatius for discernment of spirits as the Synod went on discussing the role and speaking of the Holy Spirit through various voices. And I don't say that to open up a can of synodal worms here. We don't want to get bogged down in that conversation. But, but, but it does pertain to Michael, I think, very excellent question of why it is at the present moment the church has decided to relitigate a case that seems to have been adjudicated properly already and with and with double jeopardy attached to it 
you know, uh, it, it, it seems as if double jeopardy is out the window. And we're going to say now, well, we don't care what Maximus the Confessor wrote or what De Lubach wrote or Aquinas wrote. Uh, we, we now have to take a look at what Kinsey wrote <laughs> or or, you know, well, who else who whatever sociological or psychological uh, so-called scientific uh, analyses of the human being they they want to they want to dredge up as as you know i guess new new no, and that's not to disparage science obviously it gives us an insight in, into the human being as well but anyway i, I don't want i don't want to go down necessarily that 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 rabbit hole um but i want to return to something else uh you said michael about it just boil by the way, I, I, I got the subtle dig at you, at you, at, that you sent my, you, some shade you were sending my way about my use of theological anthropology as a term here, when <laughs> I should just be using plain English and saying, what the heck is a human? Or as Wendell Berry put it, what are people for in his wonderful little book? Uh, so let's go back to that question. Uh, in the light of certain current writers, relatively popular, who, who I won't mention, who have sort of fallen into a kind of newfound monism, spiritual monism, and that the human being is essentially of the very substance of, of God. Um, I, you, you said that we are from God and for God. And in terms of, of an anthropology, I, I think it's, it's, it's in the light of certain debates, it'd be interesting to delve into that question a bit more, that Traditionally, it seems to me that all the Abrahamic faiths have made a strong and sharp distinction between the creature and the creator, a radical and sharp distinction between the creator and the creator. But Christianity comes along with its incarnational emphasis and says that that radical distinction is in the service of an, an unbelievable radical closeness, the coinciding of a radical transcendence and imminence and so so I'm, I'm wondering maybe i don't know if this is taking us off the field but i don't think it is if we could we could have a conversation about about that i don't know who wants to maybe start with, with that michael do you want to start with that um yeah well i mean you, you you've stated something you know absolutely fundamental namely that the that, that the radical transcendence uh and otherness of god um which I often wonder, you know, whether that's largely lost to us uh, in 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 thought, and for that matter, in in, in the liturgy and a thousand other places in, uh, in, in in contemporary Christianity. Yes. The very precondition for God's being, and you know, in, in Augustine's words, nearer to me than I am to myself, and for that matter, it, it, nearer to all of us than we are to ourselves in the incarnation. Um, but the two things have to be held together at the same time. I mean, the, 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 on, the, on the one hand, while it's the case that it's, it, it's the absolute otherness and transcendence that makes this radical intimacy and nearness possible, uh, it's also the case that this, that this uh, nearness and intimacy does not cancel out um, the radical distinction and otherness between God and the world. Um, and the fact that we are um, fundamentally not just in um, uh, as a matter of origin or as a matter of motive, but in our very the very structure of our being um, creatures. Right. Um, uh, from nothing, radically dependent upon God, um, uh, ordered uh, to God and, and where our relationship to God, because it is more because it is nearer to me than I am to myself, is inside of of every other relation and is recapitulated in it. So the idea, for example, to go back to your first question, um, that there's some sphere um, that we might call science, for example, uh, where that truth, which is the, the deepest and most fundamental truth of our, our, of our very nature, um, where that truth is um, bracketed out, uh, which doesn't inform uh, the object of study, which is in this case our, ourselves, um, or, or 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 the manner of our knowing it, um, to, to to approach these questions from the the, the point of view that um, metaphysics, theology, the you know the traditional understanding is obsolete, 
is it, it carries implicit within it, it seems to me, already a kind of uh, radical denial or falsification of this absolutely fundamental truth. It mm -hmm. might, it's, of course, implicit, um, and probably, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, unaware um, or, or, or unknown to, 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 to those who, um, who imply it, but it, it, it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I <clears throat> that's um, uh, want to connect that to your earlier observation, Michael, about you know why why now and what's what what is at stake in 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 um, rethinking things now. I mean, if you're going to rethink things, you need to rethink them, and inevitably, you're going to rethink them in relation to some fundamental principle that's that is either implicitly or explicitly, explicitly taken as absolute right. in the literal sense that that in, in in relation to which everything else is thought and and in the in the classical tradition i mean arguably what defines the whole classical tradition is that that absolute principle is what is in fact absolute and namely the the the, the radically transcendent god um and and uh you know once when if you begin there with a with a proper understanding it sort of it, it it sheds light on on the whole in a way that does is a, enabled to do justice to every every proper part all the way down so i mean it, it it's only when you begin make absolute what is absolute that you have room for everything else in its proper place and what what i mean you you, you suggested that in a certain sense you wonder whether whether a notion of radical transcendence is even um available to us anymore uh you know i think that's that's really worth reflecting on i think uh uh our, you know the, the the very suggestion that we that that the old metaphysics is obsolete and that we need to begin with science that in a way is a confession that we have no idea we have we're not capable of recognizing what an absolute principle is. I mean, the the the, the problem is it's it those things all, the way this always works is precisely through uh, dismissal. You know, you 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 you. I mean, there's never an argument that that the the absolute uh, transcendence of God is not the proper first principle for these reasons. I mean, there's never an argument made. It's simply dismissed as no longer relevant. Um, and, and, and that's, it's unthought. Yeah. It's not thought at all. And so, and that, and that simply means that you're going to make something that's not absolute, absolute. And that's going to, that's going to create confusion. And I, I mean, it just seems so obvious to me. I'm sorry about that. I think that was my computer that did that. Let me, let me turn that off. I mean, it just seems so obvious to me that um, uh, the uh, that there's a there's a um, a radical confusion that's built into that observation, and and you know I mean and that there's there's the irony there. It's precisely when you're in a state of confusion that you feel the need to make a decision to clarify. I mean, this is what with to go back to Ignatius, why you're tempted to change your mind when you're feeling anxious. Um, uh, but but notice what you're doing there. You're making your 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 subjective experience the measure of uh, you know the, the the reference point, the principle for your decision making, and that's catastrophic. And that's that's what we what, that's one of the things we really need to worry about now. Yeah. Can yeah. I say one more thing on this real quick, just to follow up, Dave? Um, oh, real. Yeah. You know, I know we're trying to avoid. It would be pleasant to avoid uh, the synod here. Um, but I, I just, it's an observation that the, the unthinking of the absolute of, in the way that Dave described is the condition upon which um, uh, the Holy Spirit can be bandied about so cheaply. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yes. Which goes hand in hand. I, um, I was just, uh, I'm, I'm working a new blog post uh, that'll be out soon. And I actually quote Dave in it from, I think it's your book, The Politics of the Real. A uh, pithy little quote about liberalism, but in that quote, you 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 mentioned C.S. Lewis's notion of the unchristianing, oh, yeah. uh, the unchristianing of America, and and I wonder, or not America, but of the world, uh, of the Western world, and I and 
those what now those words kept coming back and rattling my brain when I was in Rome covering the synod, when there was so little talk of Christ in yeah. any of the conversations. Yeah. I thought, is this not the un, I, that quote of yours came to mind? Is yeah. this not an example yeah. of the, the unchristianing of things or the disincarnation? Yeah, yeah. and that's and that's I mean, you, you think about um, uh, speech about the Holy Spirit without reference to Christ, which is not something you find in the, the fathers or in scholastic thought and, um but uh, unless unless the heretical versions of it i mean that th those uh, those appeals are always and, um you you want to untether uh novelty from the tradition you when i mean effectively when you want to when you want to to uh make a change <laughs> that isn't something that organically grows because you know change is, is obviously fundamental to anything that's alive but but the change that comes from life is a change that emerges organically from what's already given and from a kind of a rootedness you know flowers bloom because yeah. they're rooted in the ground um right. and and the change can often look radically different than its root uh yeah you know the caterpillar the butterfly looks virtually nothing like the caterpillar and the mustard plant looks virtually nothing like the mustard seed, but that doesn't alter the fact that upon closer examination, it is an organic development That's and right. it's profoundly organic, you know, and there's a difference between that and, and a declension from something, the distortion of something, the deliberate counterfeiting of something in a simulacrum of uh, uh, something else that is struggling to be born, but whose name we can't name yet. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I don't want to go off on. Go ahead, Rodney. Yeah, just I just want to add something to the to the to the kind of almost the counterpart of of Michael's uh, comment about the human person. It, I mean, so the thing is, if the human person isn't understood in the light of of the divine, in, in the light of what is highest, it, it's it's sort of obvious. Yeah. And all you have to do is look around, and it's obvious that we're now beginning to understand the human being in the light of not even animal. That would be kind of be refreshing. Machines. Yeah. Yeah, right? right. I mean, so 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 when you start talking about artificial intelligence and things like that, right, you're 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 sort of bemoaning the fact that we can't multiply seventy eight thousand four hundred sixty two by, you know, six billion four hundred ninety nine and, and a machine can. Yeah, I mean, you're sort of asking you're you're asking the human being to be to become something less than it is, right? Uh, I, I, right, and 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 I've been reading a lot of Matthew Crawford lately, and he's just so interesting, right? Because he's he's on and on about how uh, everything is becoming so mechanized that it, the whole purpose of this is to kind of get the human infallibility out of the equation. Right. Of course, even in instances where this becomes absurd, where it doesn't work, where the where the mechanical thing can't do what the human does, all they do is just redefine the categories so that the fault is on the on the place of the human being, right? But it's it seems ironic to me that right now in this stage of the church, we'd be asking for more input from the very ones who are degrading human beings to machines, right? I mean, this just this it's just it, it seems absurd. Can I riff on this for a minute? Um, <laughs> Nobody has to ask permission to riff on anything on my shows. You go right ahead. I want to take you know take this off, take us off course. But, um, no, but go ahead. I feel like this is a little bit like one of those like Jonas's example of a of a ship with its landmark tied to the to the bow of the, to the bow. <laughs> yeah, this conversation is going. Anyway, well, two yeah. things. One incidental, and then back to to Rodney's point. Um, on uh, Lewis's unchristianing that that David that, that you and David have invoked. Um, just to repeat the theme, I think from earlier our, our discussions, uh, Piggy is absolutely devastating on this. Oh yes, and and I mean I'm I I am increasingly convinced that Piggy and Blondell are the key to our moment, yeah. uh, uh, and to understanding it in a lot of ways. So I just want to make that little plug for if we want to understand. Uh, not a bad Christian world, but a, an unchristian world, the complete unthinking of Christianity, which is something arguably that is inside as well as outside the church. Um, yeah, we could spend some time with him. Um, but uh, and, and I'll just give a before you go on, I'll just give a plug to our friend Jenny Martin out at Notre Dame, who's done some interesting work on Peggy on that very point. But anyway, go right ahead. 
Hmm. Well, stop me if this is, uh, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I can't re remember what anecdotes I've told in which podcast. So if I'm about to say something that, you know, appeared two episodes ago, uh, stop me. But, you know, Dave and I were actually together one night uh, a couple months ago, and somebody had run uh, a question through uh, chat GPT and given him the results. And it was the question about uh, Dave Schindler's philosophy of freedom. And, um, and chat beat GPT did a very uh, impressive job of assembling um, uh, various parts of his, his, his arguments that have been scattered through various books and contrasting it, you know, uh, with the, with the liberal modern liberal view and with Locke and, and uh, uh, the way it relates to the classical tradition and so forth. Um, but the one thing that the, that chat GP cannot tell you is, um, is it true? Mm -hmm. And it strikes me, apropos of your point, Rodney, that um, the whole idea of artificial intelligence um, is premised upon a reduction of intelligence to mere computing. That's right. And, and the irony is that then that becomes the image in which we reductively mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. ourselves, and not only reductively understand ourselves, what thought is reduced to for us. Right. So it's, I've all, I find it remarkable that we live in an age in which the predominant form of reason is incapable of and uninterested in understanding. That's right. Understanding the meaning of right. things, understanding or asking about what is, understanding um, uh, truth in more than a merely functional sense. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the uh, the crucial distinction that Pieper makes a lot of um, between intellectus and ratio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I mean, is is a yeah. direct grasp of truth, but of of reality, something something other than the mind. That, you know, it has a, it's making contact with a with an object. Ratio is the discursive processing. And, uh, you know, we take for granted the, the question entirely with artificial intelligence is simply, um, can it process? How does it process information? Um, and, and notice, I mean, there's so many subtle reductions there. We, we, we perceive perception itself as simply um, the registration of information. We don't realize to touch something is not just to take in information. It's actually a real human act that has a, a profound depth to it and so forth. And something analogous can be said about all, all the senses. You know, what I remember when I was young, the question of artificial intelligence arose and the big debate then, you know, because this seems to come in waves, this, this, this problem. The big debate then was whether there was such a thing and whether you could use the term. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now uh, that, that's not debated. It's just, we, we all, I mean, we, use the term we all use it and we, we've sort of conceded it and now it's just a question of what it's going to be capable of and that's a radically different thing i mean i think subtly we've already reinterpreted what intelligence but when you say the question was can that term even be used you mean the term artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. yeah, yeah. Whether, okay. whether whether it was possible to have artificial intelligence and yeah. i mean uh and the under the understanding there was that there had to be something like a soul I mean, I, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Does something need to be alive to 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 understand? Mm. Well, I, I, that's I think the answer to that is yes, and that's why. Yes, this is why I kind of uh, you know made a ridiculous comment on a discussion I was doing on another podcast, and I thought I kind of regretted it later, but here I'm going to make it again. But you know, I I won't I won't sort of take seriously <laughs> uh, uh, artificial intelligence until I see it poop. <laughs> <laughs> then, then it's, yeah. then it's possibly yeah. a significant, you know. By the way, you can say shit, but until you <laughs> see it, take a shit. All right. Not you if I ever want that. to show my kids these, you know, discussions. Oh yeah, oh, that's true. This has to be ch child friendly. If someone's got this plane in their car right now, uh, yeah. I'm in, I'm in deep trouble. But uh, deep I, I thought, but, but did you, uh, Rodney, just give me one second. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I thought you were going to say, Dave, when you said. The big burning question back then was whether or not artificial intelligence could be conscious, self-aware yeah. and conscious. Yeah. But I think that's deeply related to what you were. What no, it's you would, totally, it's totally related. Yeah, yeah it's just related yeah, I mean, to it. Yeah. Right. To the that, point that, now, and I think the reason why now we just throw the term around as if it's no big deal is because I think the question of whether or not it is conscious 
to a lot of people that are interested in this doesn't matter. Who cares? Yeah. It's yeah. so good at imitating those of us who are living in conscious that I don't even care. It's a hair's breadth of a distinction. And as AI gets better and better and better at imitating conscious beings, maybe instead of trying to figure out how human AI can become, maybe we just need to figure out how robotic we can become. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, no, uh, I mean, it, I mean, just just think about what you're interested in when you're asking whether it can be conscious. And you substitute for that um, how well it can behave as if it were. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. just and 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 yeah. you think, well, if it can behave, then what what matter? What what you know? How could it possibly matter to me otherwise? But you think you you realize that if it does matter, it's because you're actually recognizing that there's something that has to do with insight into the inner nature of something that's distinct from simply you know measuring its its behavior. Yeah. I mean, the key here is the body, right? I mean, it's not just that the, the AI is not conscious. It, the, the fact that so much of what we l learn about the world is, is through embodied perception yeah. and embodied activity. I mean, that, that's what's, and so, but, but of course, then that kind of knowledge is discounted. Right. But like, I, I think of like watching a jazz band perform. Yeah, super interesting, right? Because because a, a, a minor theme is kind of laid down, something kind of minimal, and then these guys go off, and it seems like they're just doing nonsense. But obviously, it's it's extremely difficult to do what they're doing and yeah. keep it all together. Yeah. But they're watching each other, right? And, and they're and they're, key, they're keying in on things, and there's all sorts of like little there's body language and looks and and things like that. And that's and, all and something like a groove <laughs> that is that is that is beyond what you can't describe it, you know. That's but it's, right. I mean, we yeah. all know what I'm talking about, and yes. it's a real thing. Yeah, but it's something that could be quantified, you know. But it's beyond calculation. That's the point. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, going to be conscious when when like uh, I I just read the other day that you know the the scat sort of singing in in uh, jazz, you know, Louis Armstrong, that it, it sort of got invented when Louis Armstrong was doing uh, a recording and dropped the sheet music and for, didn't have the words in front of him. And so he just started, you know, making up heebie jeebie, heebie jeebie, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and and so could it was well, the day that chat GPT can do that, uh, mm -hmm. then that, you know, can, you know, does the equivalent of losing its losing its algorithm and yeah. can still nevertheless make some shit up. Almost, there I go using that word again. But anyway, <laughs> Michael, you've been patiently trying to say something. So go ahead. Well, I'm laughing at a, at a joke to myself. <laughs> in your that's cell something that that chat you can't do. Something about you said. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, first of all, you know, Mayo's point about about uh, AI behaving as if it were conscious puts me in mind of something that Hannah Arendt said, which I think was really. Um, uh, moved me when she said it when I, when I read it um that you know the terrifying thing about behaviorism is not that it's false but that it could become true mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> in other words, yeah. human beings could be deprived of precise you know if through our form of life could be deprived of precisely those qualities uh uh which have heretofore um uh identified us as human and in, in, in her case it would be the capacity for action over against mere behavior and what you're describing louis armstrong as 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 being capable of doing or what any of us are capable of doing when we're able to ask whether dave's philosophy of freedom is true or not uh and to philosophize that out for ourselves um is a, a, a form of, of 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 action in that sense i mean obviously it involves speech and the rest of it but um, it's a different mode than the mere uh, than than a, a mere sort of calculation of of infinite bits of data, and you can always re represent what we're actually doing as the mere you know you you can you can suck the sap right out of it by presenting it as the calculation of mere bits of data as if seeing were really just you know light bouncing off of objects affecting the retina as opposed to an act of the mind and of the soul of perception and all the rest of it, but but you're you're losing contact with a, a, a vital aspect, the, the, the fundamental, a fundamental aspect of, of our human reality. And 
what worries me, this will sound, this might seem like a reach, but I keep going back to your, to your first question and the, you know, the, the, the anthropological hand grenade or time bomb hidden within that um, synodal document about revisiting our anthropology. My great concern, um, and you yourself have talked about how there's nothing heretical being propounded here and all of the rest of it. You've I've read a number of things you've written and said about that, Larry. And, and um, I, I, I think that's right, because the, 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 the real concern here is not that something false will be taught as true. What the real concern is here is acquiescence to a form of thought in which there is neither true nor false. Yeah. Bingo. Because yeah. there's no longer, because there's no longer understanding, and so the the, the simple, the, the the simply the sort of disappearance of the question of truth, as as if what is the human being, and there might be a true answer that's something like a human nature that corresponds to that, um, just can't fit within what thinking is for us now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just, I mean, I just published a blog post a few days ago that the subtext, which is, is this question of heresy, is oh, question, right. it's question begging. Because the deeper question isn't whether or not this or that hierarch has uttered some howler of orthodox nonsense or, or heterodox nonsense. The, the deeper question is whether XYZ hierarchs actually believe in God or the formal causation that follows in one's thought processes, if one believes in Christ and God, that there's something far more foundational going on here in the re the hollowing out of traditional theological language and the filling in of that hollowed out space with an altogether foreign idea. That that's the danger here. That's the danger here, not whether or not the changes in death penalty teaching are heterodox or whether some obscure footnote in Amoris Laetitia is heterodox. These, these are complete side issues, and I don't want to get anybody in trouble here. These are just my opinions and not necessarily those of my guests. Uh, but yeah, that I think you're right on, Michael. I think that there are much, much deeper issues here relating to fundamental questions that are just not getting addressed. Yeah, and th I mean, this is just a small observation there uh, and, and fairly obvious, I suppose. But I mean, if you, if you think about the kinds of things that we're discussing, um, you know, humanity itself is at stake, Th then you realize how profound and serious is the task of the church to hold on to these things and, and to retain this fundamental kind of anchoring in in reality, which is being uh, uh, abandoned everywhere else, um, you know this is, yes. this is so. So this is why what's going on in the church concerns not just Catholics, but it's it concerns the whole world. Yes, it does, and I'd like to say too that here we are sitting here. We're we're critiquing both the right and the left, and you know, and all that. And, and one of the criticisms that can often that are often leveled. And people like us say, oh, you guys think you're above the fray, that you have the answers to everything. And and my my answer to that is just because we think we're right doesn't mean we're wrong, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and 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 our interlocutors on both the right and the left, whether it's the progressive left or the rad tread right, also think that they're right. So I, I, I would just like to say that right now, because I often get that criticism. Oh, Mr. Smarty Pants, you're always critical of the progressives. You're critical of the traditionalists. You're critical of the neocons. What the hell do you believe in then? You know, obviously you think you're above the fray. No, I just think I'm right. <laughs> and that doesn't make me wrong uh, just because I think I'm right. But anyway, that's my little you know, be ridiculous to say something that you didn't think was right. I mean, that's, that's right. And yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I don't even understand that criticism anymore. Yeah. So anyway, Rodney, you wanted to say something. Go ahead. You know, I, I may have lost get us that. back on course. Get us back uh, on course. So I was just going to repeat Baltazar's uh, uh, statement that the uh, that Christians will have to be the guardians of metaphysics yeah. in, in, in our age. And I think that's what D.C. Schindler was saying there is uh, that. Um, yeah, it's, it's it, what, something really serious is at stake. We're not only defending things that are good for the church. We're, we're defending things that are indispensable for for human beings, for human life, uh, you know. Which is what Michael was getting at is like yes. general down from the to the less than human. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think, yeah, absolutely. And and so, you know, to to bring it back to square one at the discussion of uh, you know, 
what is a human being? What are people for? Theological anthropology, any of those questions. That there, there's a lot at stake here, and not just in terms of of human sexuality, because I think that there are members of the some members of the synod and synodality who who want to redefine our human nature in certain ways. But then also on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, there, there, I think there's a desire to revisit the, the, the council's theological anthropology, in particular its theology of nature and grace, precisely in order to return us to uh, a different iteration of the, of the relationship between church and state, let's put it that way, mm-hmm. to call into question Dignitatis Humanae's definition of human dignity, human freedom, and its relationship to non-coercive religious states, and so on. Uh, so I, I think that issue of how all of this pertains to what freedom is mm-hmm. in, in, a, in a modern political iteration and what the church's viewpoint, that too could possibly be, you know, the, the, the synodal fathers need to be careful about what it is that they resurrect in terms of questions of anthropology, because they may not like what they end up seeing uh, coming from the opposite end of the spectrum. That's an interesting point. Yeah, no, I don't think we tend to think of it in those terms. Um, but when, right, I mean, the, and, and in fact, there's ample evidence, the more uh, we lose our anchor in reality, um, the more there's a kind of uh, a disillusion uh, of of you know the fundamental the foundations of society. I mean the the, the reactions go in both directions. I mean there's 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 quite a bit of you know the extreme right um, uh, uh, introducing violence as much as you know progressive um, shenanigans. Well, yeah, I mean you see Bishop. Well, I don't want to go to Bishop Snyder's new new catechism, but. Uh, but that, but I do want to, and I, I'm going to throw you guys a curveball here because you probably aren't aren't ready for this, and didn't I didn't bring it up or prepare, it, although obliquely maybe I did. Uh, the, the the question of dignitatis humanae mm-hmm. does come up, I think, in these conversations about theological anthropology, what a human being is. David, you know, you've written on 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 this. I know Nick Healy and your father wrote, wrote on this. So I, I would like, because I know a lot of my viewers and listeners are are on the more conservative end of the spectrum, and many of them have read things that would call into question whether or not dignitatis humanae represents this radical rupture with the tradition or what's really going on there. So maybe we can have a conversation about that in, in the light of, of anthropology. So does anybody want to start with that, or should we just punt that question and move on to something else. Okay, maybe I'll venture a, a, okay. a, or two out towards the edge of the cliff here. A um, couple of thoughts occur to me straight away. Um, one is that the distinction that we were making earlier um, between um, action and behavior, you know, the, the distinction that Hannah Arendt makes so much of, for example, yeah. Um, really turns on, on on the question of truth. In other words, the capacity for free uh, human action, uh, a sort of undivided uh, decision for or, or or action in favor of uh, the good, um, depends upon um, uh, the truth and the capacity to 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 apprehend it, and so. Um, in that sense, insofar as action is what differentiates us, um, is part of what differentiates us as human um, from mere automata, you know, and and and, and mere sort of behavioralist functioning. Um, that's the capacity to preserve our freedom and our capacity to freely act depends very much on our preservation of this capacity for uh, understanding uh, and apprehending the truth. That's the one thing I would want to say. On the other side, now looking at the more in the in the in the direction of politics, I would I would, and I know Dave is has written and is writing a lot about this, so I'm basically just teeing it up for you here, Dave. Um, that um, it, it seems to me, on the other hand, is that um, the, the 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 presence of or the reality of truth, that is to say, the the givenness of. Uh, an intelligible order that makes our freedom possible 
also lies at the root of the distinction between um, authority and power. Uh, and yes. the, the way in which authority operates, I mean, I can't quote it off the top of my head, um, but there's a, this beautiful uh, passage in Dignitatis Humani, which I think captures uh, beautifully, precisely that uh, the, the way in which truth works interiorly. You know, it can't move except by uh, sort of eliciting our assent to it, right? It, it moves with power precisely because it moves quietly, because it because it depends upon recognition, right? You can you can only you 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 can't compel someone to understand. That's a movement that takes place from the inside out. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, many of uh, our friends or, or 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 those that you were talking about uh, before on the, uh, the the Catholic right uh, who are very suspicious of dignitatis humanae and want a more, shall we say, uh, robust um, uh, uh, want that, the, the church to have a more robust and coercive role in the political sphere, at least in in, in principle. Um, don't adequately grasp uh, the distinction between uh, uh, authority and power and the different modes of their operation. So yes. what's necessary on the one hand to preserve us from this kind of uh, post-human uh, sort of reduction to some version of mass humanity on the one hand, um, and this is not an argument for liberal democracy or anything like that. I mean, I'm just getting kind of looking at this um, uh, metaphysically from back lack of a better way of putting it, um, to, to, to state that off on the other hand and uh, to uh, begin to develop or understand, um, on the other hand, uh, 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 the, the, the deeper truth, I think, of, of, of dignitatis humanae probably depends upon being able to unfold uh, that distinction between authority and power and their relationship to, um, uh, to, to truth than we have heretofore done and then our, than our friends do. Yeah, and you know, Ratzinger, along these lines, talks about the fact that in a Christian context, it is only when power is ex exercised kenotically in a cruciform manner does it have authority. Uh, and and I think that that's a key point in all of these sorts of discussions of integral states and politics. But anyway, uh, Dave, did you want to? Yeah, I, I I really don't have a lot to, to add. Uh, what? what? Come on, the author of the politics of the real. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, you'll notice I don't talk about dignitas humani in there. I mean, you know, I you I, don't. You really don't. You know, I noticed that. You know, I'm I'm in the end, I'm a philosopher rather than a theologian. So you know, yeah. I, come, I come to these issues from a kind of a different angle. But but um, it does it does uh, I I find it. Um, really illuminating how much of these kinds of questions are are um, I mean there are two there are two traits one is um, the, the one that Michael already mentioned uh, uh, the the question is is tends to be the, the question that gets debate debated uh, tends to be how much um, the church has a cer certain right to a kind of coercive power whether using it herself or making use of the the instruments of the status course of power that those and you know and the the, the limits to that i mean that that, that tends to dominate the, the discussion not that that's not an irrelevant um question but it but it seems to me if that's the the first or the principal question that you ask you've totally misunderstood what politics is you've conceded a modern uh, notion of politics and a modern horizon for the political, and in, in which case you're not. No matter what you end up with, in, in in the end, it's going to be a betrayal of the of the church's position. So that's one one thing. And then the other thing I find so fascinating, and it's related to this, is how radically uh, intra ecclesial the the reflections tend to be. They they, they tend to be dominated by um, uh, uh, you know scrutiny of. of church documents <laughs> yes. laying out the principles you know you you really don't get much of a of a deep kind of intrinsic reflection on the nature of of the political order and you know this isn't um uh there you know all of the the participants in this discussion there's a there's a whole spectrum and people have different um emphases and so forth but the, but it seems to me that that those two observations i i, I just encounter them over and over and over and over again I couldn't agree more. I mean, you see it all the time. You know, they'll quote 
you know, Pope Gregory, you right. know, that religious freedom is absurd. And oh, QED, there you go. Slam dunk. Yeah. He said it's absurd. I mean, regardless of whether he might have been talking about French style laicite and that kind of thing, you know, it's it's nevertheless, it's a blanket condemnation of religious freedom. And it's in a church document from a pope. So there you go. But anyway, Rodney, do you want to add to this? You know, I don't I'm not sure I have much to add. Um that seems to be a common theme here. I'm, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. Well, no, Ryan, I mean, while you're yeah. thinking, may I, while you're thinking, may I just add one thing that my Please, dad, I remember, beg you. Yeah. My my dad's uh, you know, right at the end of his life. Yes. Uh, bar, you know, I mean, he was having increasing difficulty processing to use that language. Um uh things, but but the the issue that that he was really occupied with at the end was um uh raising something that you know in a way it's it's a it's a form of a theme that that occupied most of his life but um uh sort of a, a novel version of it in relation to more contemporary discussions this the the, the question of the neutrality of the liberal state and you know right, the right. issue about whether whether or not there's such a thing as a confessional state um yeah yeah uh, you know, or whether whether the church embraces something like a confessional state. I mean, um, that question is a very different question if you recognize that um, any political order, by definition, is going is a confessional. It, right, it's confessional in some fundamental sense that it takes for granted um, ultimate judgments about the nature of God. Well, so you know exactly. I mean, is there not a more hard integralist state than America? Yeah, in, in right. some sense. I mean, do we not hold these truths not to be self-evident, but hegemonically in control of everything and in everything we speak and say and think? Right. Uh, I, 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 you know, we live in such a completely unbelievably integral concept yeah. of, of, of government in our in our country. It's unbelievable. But anyway, so, yeah, that that's a point well taken. So then it's just a question of nuancing what it is that a Catholic is supposed to do prudentially as, as yeah, it approaches well, I, mean, I, I actually think that the deepest question is um you know what what uh yeah how, how to put this um what are the resources within the christian tradition to to recognize that it's precisely and this comes back to some point that rodney made right at the beginning um you know if christ reveals man to himself then um, you know, if you, you interpret that in a, in a really robust and, and rich analogical way, there's a sense in which um, uh, recognizing the Christian tradition, properly speaking, um, liberates the natural order in ways that, that could, could put, in principle, do more justice to um, what we, what, what we um, uh, intuitively recognize is important in something like tolerance, you know, religious pluralism and so forth. Um, yeah. yeah. As, as, as in contrast to the liberal tradition, which cannot actually recognize anything like religion. And so there's no religious liberty possible. Um, uh, and again, that, that changes yeah. the, terms of the discussion. And not only, it, it, only the, 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 the sort of Catholic, anthropology let's put it this way has enough largesse within it to truly guarantee religious freedom yeah. in a manner consonant with the dignity yeah. of human beings right that, that the second the, the church has always been faithful to that and i think that's what dignitatis humana is saying that it, it yeah. explicitly says we're not changing anything in the church's teaching about confessional states that all stands what we're saying is that regardless of what confessional state you come up with there ha you have to have some concept of religious freedom embedded in that because of now our, our increased awareness of human dignity and, and all that that entails. And therein lies an articulation of a deeply Catholic retrieval of something extremely important that I think you were just hitting upon, Dave. And I think that's central. But anyway, M Michael, you, you look like you want to say something. Two, two thoughts. One, just uh, underscoring uh, Dave's point about the complete absence of, of, of religious freedom and liberal order is that the price of, of, uh, survive religious survival in in liberal order is that you have to reconceive whatever your faith is as a version of uh, Protestant congregationalism, right. which is to say as a voluntary part within uh, within the greater secular whole, right. uh, which which already contains within it 
both a theological an ecclesiological and a cosmological claim implicitly so that's that's and you, and you can try to think outside of that but you can't live outside of it uh, right. in, in an integrated way, and, and therefore we do not have religious freedom. Right. Um, and, and, and we don't see that we don't have re religious freedom because we have uh, fundamentally remade ourselves uh, in, in that image. And that, I think, is at the root of a great many of the other problems that we were talking about earlier in the discussion. The other thing that I wanted to say had to do with, with this point about, uh, with, with Dave's point about Catholicism being able uh, to preserve um, in an integral way, uh, what it is that, that liberalism claims to preserve. And it, it precisely has to do with the unity of uh, uh, freedom and truth. And I think in, in, in one level, the point is very, is very simple. I mean, if your highest religious duty um, um, is to love God um, uh, uh, above all, I mean, that can't be compelled. Right, yeah. Yeah. That is by definition a free act, and yeah. so any any society within which that 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 um, command can be realized um, yeah. has to offer space for that act to take place, which does not require um, a, 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 a denial or a negation of the truth on which that command is premised. In yeah. fact, the affirmation of the command yeah. and the and, and the space to to exercise it go together. And I mean, sorry, I know Rodney, you you want to jump in here too, but I mean, no, go ahead. I, I, I have just one thing to say, but I can wait. Yeah, just to just because I think people misunderstand the implication of of your point, and I, but I, I think you put it really well, Michael. Uh, the, especially right there at the end. I mean, people assume that to have like an officially recognized religion in some respect, to 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 recognize the authority of a particular tradition, is identical to is the same thing as. Um, using coercive means to make people believe and that that's where that i mean and that's just not the case at all it's, right. it's it's entirely possible to give official recognition to something and not uh make adherence to it uh, co uh you know coerce adherence to it right yeah. precisely because adherence can't be coerced right that's right that's right if you understand what the ad adherence means sorry right. a, a stop sign a, a stop a stop sign is coercive yeah. But in a different way than spike strips are, are coercive. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's put let's put it that way. Yeah. That's no, a bad analogy, a but go ahead. No, I was just gonna make a parallel to the to the to the to the situation in the Roman Empire. Um, I mean, the Romans on the one hand were very religiously tolerant, right? I mean, it, it, they were religiously yeah. pluralistic, right? You the right, pantheon right. kind of testifies to that. Right. But it was what's what's ironic is that. The, the problem precisely they have with Christians is their refusal to relativize the God they believed in, right? So so the fact that they wouldn't just count their God as one among a, a pantheon of gods precisely yeah. led to the coercion of the state, you know, coming down on them through force in, in violent ways, right? Whereas when, when Theodosius kind of, I think, proposed to, you know, illegalize pagan practices his theological advisor said no you can't do that because you can't coerce these people to to believe in christ they have to come about it in, in a different way so i think we're almost in the identical situation right that that liberalism is the literally the coercive proposal of pluralism yeah. that anybody that doesn't believe in pluralism is going to be is going to be eradicated maybe gently but but, but eradicated yeah. uh, i would go I, I would go a step further though rodney too it is yeah. true that the Romans looked askance of the Christians because they refused for their God to be assimilated into the pantheon of gods. But I would argue that that by itself was not enough to solicit persecutions. What solicited the persecutions was that fact plus one, which is that because of the refusal to assimilate, Christians would not give a pinch of incense to Caesar. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, th I think that is also pertinent to sure, our sure. situation Absolutely. today, yeah. Yeah. that yeah. we will not give a pinch of incense to Caesar. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but anyway, I, yeah. I just wanted to toss that I in. I think most Catholics will give a pinch of, of incense to Caesar. Well, that's the thing, right? <laughs> and we're right back to square one with regard to, you know, certain post-synodal documents and looking at human anthropology again and maybe maybe just maybe we can offer a pinch of incense to certain 
modern ideas foreign to the gospel that nevertheless we might want to import here. Um, but anyway, uh, anybody Michael, have it? Mike, Michael, you look yeah. like you've got something good yeah, to say. I was just going to agree with Rodney. I like I like the idea of you know enforced. I forget exactly how you put it. Enforced, enforced pluralism or enforced tolerance. I mean. Yeah, I mean, liberalism is basically where you're, you know, you're you're free to believe anything you want as long as it's false. Yeah, <laughs> but as long as it has no actual sort of binding, transcendent bearing on anything, including yourself. Right. But all yeah. religions are equal, equally trivial. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's just different ways. Yeah, I Which say that I used to say that to my students all the time. Yes, liberalism says that all religions before the law are equal. And that's because all religions are equally trivial, like whether or not you like fruitcake over plum pudding. Uh, you know, it's 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 de gustibus, you know, and that's the way the state treats it. But it's sometimes even worse than that. But anyway, Dave, did you have something you wanted to say? No, nope, nothing. I just think that one of the interesting things in, in your book, Politics of the Real, was was to point out precisely. And, and Michael, you alluded to this, too, that it isn't. We, we live in this mythology that there is this thing called religious freedom. And yet, really, it's not, because if you look carefully at what it is that, let's, let's say, the American state says with regard to religious freedom, it's, it's clearly something that the state self-limits, right? Yeah. The, 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 it's not, we're going to grant religious freedom because we recognize certain natural entities outside of the state that are pre pre-state right, that are more aboriginal than the state and therefore carry a weight and authority that the state has no authority over and must pay attention to. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying we, the state, have decided that we, the state, will carve out this little space for you, for you little underlings. And that, that's not really freedom at all, is it? As long as it's voluntarist and congregationalist, it's, it's uh, you know, yeah. Right. So which means it's not religious freedom. Right. It's freedom to something else. I mean, if, if religion, uh, you know, a right. being bound back to a tradition, to uh, you know, it's to the communal acts of worship and so forth, that 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 make this reality a, a, a res publica, a public thing. Then yeah. you, you can have freedom to something, but it's not religion. And right. calling it religious freedom is 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 uh, you know just a mystery. which is why I want to go back to our conversation before we were with regard to dignitatis humanity and the Catholic vision is that it really is despite what people think in terms of outward appearances or maybe historical precedent. It really is the Catholic vision that gives us a much greater, deeper philosophical, metaphysical, and theological foundation for the concept of religious freedom, more, much more so than liberalism does in, yeah. in, in, in the long run. Yeah, and that seems really outrageous until you just, until you just point out I mean, you can you'd have to make a long argument to 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 show all this, but in principle, <laughs> the incarnation allows a, a deeper sense of the affirmation of the you know the relative autonomy of the natural, and the incarnation belongs to the Christian tradition. But then it, it it's precisely that as a tradition that is crucial. And then the question is where where do you have that? And yeah, yeah. So, so it's not just a preference for one denomination over others. It's it's the the, the affirmation of the incarnation as a tradition that's at the the root of the claim. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're sort of uh, we're we're running low on time here. We've already been going for about an hour and uh, fifteen minutes or so. But I, I do want to kind of come full circle and and come back to the the question of the post-synodal document and say we need to take another look at human anthropology uh, with regard to the sort of the, especially the sexual morality of the church. And so I would like to end with however brief a conversation with a discussion of what are what are the 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 theological anthropological question, uh, questions that arise or the questions of what is a human being? What are the questions that arise in that context for the church? In, in light of human sexuality. In other words, the church's teaching has long been based on a, on a classical natural law, Thomistic Aristotelian understanding of teleologies and, and these kinds of things. And it seems to me that precisely what was brought up at the Synod, and then precisely what then shows up in this little bombshell in the post synodal document, 
it seems to me, I could be wrong, is a calling into question of those very metaphysical philosophical foundations and that there is a desire now to move beyond those to something else that something else is is desiring or struggling to be born here in the church's moral theology maybe we can get some thoughts from you guys what what is that something else that's struggling to be born is it a good thing is it a bad thing uh what should we look out for here um those are open-ended questions i know but does anybody want want to start with that with that cover that loaded conversation can i just say something chap about um it, it seems to me that i mean baltazar i think does something really good here where he basically links personhood with mission in a, in a yes. profound way and maybe there, there might be problems there or whatever um I always think of that passage in Paul, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he uh, prepared in advance, which sort of means that like who we are is something that Christ has known from all eternity. And, 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 and we're always trying to grow into that thing, you know, if yeah. you, um, if you think about your life in terms of mission, your focus changes, I think, fundamentally, right? It, it no longer thinks about my experience of this or that or the other, but it's always, you know, sort of what am I called to do? And, and in a sense, what am I going to be in eternity, right? Because that's that's really what we're shooting for. We're, we're, we're shooting for the, the person we're going to be in heaven, right? And, and that, it seems to me, to be precisely what we've kind of gotten our eye off the ball of a, a, a little bit, right? So we're, we're following the culture in terms of talking about certain experiences and certain proclivities and certain inclinations and, and all these different things. That is That just seems to me to be a, a spiral that can only go downwards, right? It's, 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 I know me, like I need to, I definitely need to be called up. I don't need to well, be that's the up. thing, right? Because <laughs> right. this is, this is why I think this is such a vitally important question yeah, yeah. because the council fathers knew we've all known that there needs to be a reform in the church's moral theology. I studied yeah. any Germain Grise. His whole life was spent trying to reform to a certain, I, I don't necessarily agree with all of his reforms of moral theology, because yeah. I think everybody has this sense that a purely deontological ethic rooted then in a white knuckled asceticism, you know, especially in sexual, just it freaking doesn't work. No. Okay. On a phenomenological existential level, whatever, however you want to describe it, but that doesn't mean we need to run headlong like lemmings off the Kinsey and cliff. Okay. <laughs> if you to put it that way. So what's, so the, I'm, I, I have no agenda here I, in, in my friend, my words of my friend, Bill Portier, moral theology is crap. So, you know, <laughs> hey, dude, moral theology stinks. You know, that, that that's that's my friend, Bill, all, all of our friends, Bill, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, that's just me venting right now. Does anybody have any comments about this beyond, you know, Rodney's comment, I think, is spot on that missional Balthazarian thing. It goes beyond even virtue ethic. It goes deeply into what I'm called to be as a Christian, which is far more aspirational, far more aspirational towards the good rather than a negative reaction against what we fear is the bad. Uh, I get that. There's a great book by Bishop Eric Varden called Shattering the Loneliness, which where he, in the great chapter called Lot's Wife, I recommend everybody read it, where he has this beautiful quote about the need for our moral theology to be aspirational towards the good. The reason why Lot's wife got turned into pillar because she kept, she wanted to look back at old desires and, and a kind of yeah. older, and she didn't look towards the good yeah. to, that it wasn't more aspirational. But anyway, I just toss that out there. Anybody else have any comments uh, on this? Just on, on that point, And I, I wish, I, I think I have it somewhere behind me, but I'd have to look for it. I'm not going to waste your time. There's a, a book by a, a, an, an Orthodox theologian um, called, I think, The Ethics of Beauty. Mm. Um, it was published just a few years ago, and I'm 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 blanking on his name. Um, but I, I think that's another way to put uh, what you said. You know, aspiration towards the good. But imagine, I mean, think about it as an aspiration towards the beautiful, or that that yeah. that the 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 um, 
uh, epiphany of the beautiful is what enables then the aspiration towards the good. And, you know, it, it's it's interesting, you, you made the connection with with uh, questions of sexuality. I mean, um, the the John Paul II's theology of the body, there, there are all sorts of interpretations of it. And, and and banalizations of it, but but um, <laughs> what, one of the, the the basic points is that the, that this this um, sense of mission, this calling beyond yourself, um, is inscribed in the flesh. I mean, so that that's the basic meaning of the sexual difference is that at the very core of your being, as intimate as it could possibly be, there's this aspiration to what is other than yourself that is not simply the you know uh, an aspiration to um a kind of gratification of of pleasure but an aspiration to a a, a joy that bears fruit and calls you even further and even further so that the, this this, yeah. this this transcendence is built into our flesh and and you know wanting to res to resist morality um it's not accidentally connected to a desire to rethink the meaning of sexuality. It seems to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Michael. Yeah. Picking up a bit on what, on what Dave said, you know, I don't think I, I don't wholly uh, endorse uh, our friend Bill's judgment about the, the, well, I don't either, but I just thought I would throw it in there because well, I think it's a common perception, right? Yeah. It's just a, there it is. Sorry, the ethics of beauty. Yeah. That, that, and, and I think Dave's comment points to this: is that, that, that moral theology um, always presupposes uh, something more deeper or fundamental than moral theology. It it, it 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 presupposes the you know the theological anthropology that you were talking about in the beginning. It presupposes ontology, and um, the. It turns out that you know a fundamental aspect of John Paul II's project, you know, even prior to his pontificate, is the recognition um, that the, the capacity uh, for for morality turns out to be integral to precisely that personal unity of interiority, exteriority, spirit, and flesh um, that we were uh, that we were talking about um, in the beginning. And my great fear, and one of the reasons why I don't like talking in the language of moral theology, is because it makes it easy to sort of sever um, right. the moral from its ontological and human basis. Uh, right. And when you do that, it's much easier both to obscure um, uh, what's at stake in these questions. And I think those who want to change or would like to see a, 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 an updating of the church's se sexual morality actually have a positive stake in obscuring what is at stake. In yes. These I mean, there I, is I, a I, remarkable, for example, and I'll just, I'll just say his name. Um, I, I find it absolutely remarkable, you know, that father Martin can carry on with, with, with his campaign um, for yes. LGBTQ recognition with no acknowledgement whatsoever of all that is entailed in that recognition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is entailed about the claim of the nature of things, what's entailed about the place of biotechnology in human society, what's, what, what's entailed about the, the, the meaning of motherhood and fatherhood and childhood. I mean, you can't have um, what he claims to want. But, I mean, it, it is, as I, as I think I wrote somewhere, a seamless garment. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And I... Yeah, mother's, absolutely. Uh, How he... mother's everything beneath it. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, you know, it just struck me, you know, as I'm observing the synod, that there is no, there was such theological superficiality that all of the downstream theological consequences that are the entailments of these various positions that were being advocated were never being considered, as if these are all little discrete standalone issues and things, which is already a very modern anti-metaphysical way of thinking, right? That what's your opinion on this issue? Well, first we need to talk about first principles. Then we'll get, no, I don't want to hear your stupid first principles. Let's get to the issues. And that's, to me, the level at which the Senate was talking. And then to go back to this question, to the, Dave held up the book about the ethics of the beautiful. I talked about Eric Varney. Yeah, I just mentioned his name. This It's Timothy Patitsas, in case anybody 
Timothy. Spell it. Spell it for those who are just listening. Last, last name is P A T I T S A S. Okay. And it's beauty. called The Ethics of Beauty. I must get that myself. I was talking about Eric Varden's, uh, you know, where he's talking about the, the aspirational towards goodness. Rodney was talking about Balthazar's more missional approach. I think that the, the thing that strikes me, and as I look at the synodal document, right, is it says we need to re examine anthropology with an eye towards blah, blah, XYZ. I would feel more comfortable with that if the entirety of the synodal document from the from the instrument of laboris on through the city on through the final document actually spoke about Christ, right. actually spoke about sanctification, actually spoke about you know supernatural aspirational things, and that goes hand in hand with your comment, Michael, about you know Father Martin and not thinking of the downstream consequences. Of, well, that's that's what happens when you're not focused. On, on the central the central ideas of the Christian evangel, and you get these little discrete issues, nobody wants to talk about what the downstream consequences are to the Christian evangel, and it's not talked about at all for that reason. Yeah, and my, and my great fear here is that, you know, whatever it is that is, is, is struggling to be born, uh, it will inevitably be more than we bargained for. Yeah. And and my my concern is my, my deepest concern about this, particularly when you know this whole movement in some ways treads on either severing um, uh, Christian moral theology from its anthropological and ontological basis, or reducing that to some sort of superficial deliverance of the sciences, which amount to more or less the same thing. My my. my deepest concern in all of this is that the fundamental question, which John Paul II recognized, right, the, the, the question of, of, of the human being, right, and the human being in relation, you know, on which in some ways the question of God hinges, um, uh, that um, that's going to be obscured. It's yes. going to be obscured intellectually in terms of our ability to think uh, and understand about it in all the ways that it's already being obscured by the transformations of thought that we've already discussed. Um, uh, and it's going to be obscured um, practically by the things that it catalyzes and is already catalyzing in our society. You know, you can't have uh, a, a regime of LGBTQ normativity without a, a, a biomedical industry accompanying it and helping to bring it about. That's right. Um, We've already made these decisions about the most profound human matters um, with on the most superficial basis. And this is how you this is how you end up in a in, in not only a post-Christian uh, but a post-human world. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. And uh, why don't we sort of unless somebody and, else and is on that beautiful note? <laughs> yes, let's uh, let's end on a beautiful note of a post-human world. It's lingering before us. All right. I think maybe th that I'm going to take my cue from that and that from here on out, I should end all of my podcasts on a very apocalyptic, very apocalyptic <laughs> note. Well, because I'll have to come back for your next episode to see how it all ends. Yeah. <laughs> if, if there is one. Uh, you know. All right. Well, anyway, we, we've been at this almost an hour and a half, and uh, I just want to thank not only my, my uh, listeners and viewers, but these three fantastic intellects sitting uh, before me, uh, who I'm all, I always learn from and always uh, humbled by their by their scholarship and their intelligence. I, I'm just always happy when they're able to come on my show. So thanks guys. Thanks for everything. Thanks for taking a night away from your families and so on. And thanks, um, thanks for having us, Larry. Yeah, this is, it's always a treat. Yeah, it's always yeah. fun. All right. Thanks a lot guys. And thanks a lot.